Good morning, everyone. Wouldn't you know, I've got a question for you. Has there ever been a time in your life when you've done something uh, in total innocence and ignorance, but the consequences were rather painful and miserable? Who wants to tell us about it? Briefly. Yeah, good old Carol. Not so much the old, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, so uh, about, I don't know, maybe three, four years ago, um, a family party at my brother's house on Boxing Day. So, um, you know, there was loads of us, and as you trundle in, you know, everyone's there, and hello, and blah, blah. And then I just heard, like, trans gone through and hello and we're still there like at the seat and great business <laughs> and I can hear Frank out so I finished hugging and kissing and then I could hear Frank saying to my niece oh wh oh so what did what did you get for Christmas Flora and she said by this time I was sort of looking I'm going to join in and talk she said oh I got hamsters and I said very loud. I said, hamsters? Oh no, they're the worst pet in the world. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then Frank looked at me and went, ooh. So I said, oh no. And uh, there was a bit of a hush silence. And um, so I said, no, it's okay, but they're sort of nocturnal animals anyway. So Frank sort of say oh come on show me oh where are they blah blah and went down so then I sort of I'm paddling like mad <laughs> and then I thought well, how can I retrieve this so because I saw my sister-in-law's face anyway so we went down the, the, the cage there's two of them in there so I said oh this one oh this one like oh this one's snowy and this one is oh he's asleep and this one I said oh what's this one's name so she said Jaws so I said Jaws. I said, why did you call him Jaws? So she said, because every time I pick him up, he bites me. But that was God giving me a get out because then I could say, which was the reason why, because my kids had hamsters or a hamster. So we learned. Um, then I said, oh dear. I said, darling, that's what I meant. I mean, they're lovely pets, but in the daytime when you want to play with them, they want to sleep. You know, anyway, so that was that. And I think it, um, I tried to make good. And my sister-in-law disappeared upstairs for half an hour. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Someone else. Don't be shy. Yeah. This was a long time ago. Um when I was in boarding school, we were told not to have a social night, but I was determined to have a social night. So I told the social prefect, it's okay, they've cleared it, no one will tell us otherwise, let's have a social night. So we went ahead and had a social night. And the following, the, the principal got to know about this. And they said, whoever said to the social prefect, say we should have a social night, you put their hands up. And I did, but they wouldn't believe me. They thought it was my sister because she's always the <laughs> naughty one. And um, they gave her punishment, and I was saying to the principal, actually it was me, I actually said to the social prefect to go ahead with the socials. Still wouldn't believe me, and my sister was taking this punishment, even though she was saying, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. <laughs> and eventually I went and joined her in cutting the grass, and they said, why are you doing this? Because I, it's, it's, it's my punishment you're giving my sister. I had to actually find a way to prove to them that it was me. And my sister would say, never again will I be naughty because even you're naughty and I'm taking the blame for this. And I was really sorry. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay, one more. Something that you've done in total innocence and ignorance that has resulted in a great deal of pain and suffering. <laughs> um, Jesus, oh God. Calm down to me, it's not about you. <laughs> Um, my mom was unwell two years ago and I 
every effort to get a carer for her back home failed. Eventually, I got a local agency and they got me a carer for her. Unbeknown to me, the carer appeared to, seems to be an illegal immigrant. My sister was, my sister living with my mom was arrested um, in place of me because I violated the immigration law in Nigeria. Um, the carer came from um, Benin Republic, which is another country in West Africa. So I had to, from here, get a lawyer in Nigeria to secure her bail um, because they were threatening that if I don't come down or release my mom, it is something year old, disabled woman. Um, <laughs> if I don't come down or my sister, then they will take my mom instead and parade her in front of a national TV for child trafficking. So it got seriously out of hand. I was heavily traumatized, something I had done in, you know, complete innocence to, to care for an elderly uh, person. Eventually, my sister was released. I paid a hefty fine in cash. Um, and the rest is geography or history. So <laughs> Case closed. Thank you. Ouch. But my own little story is, is a, a, a little painful one. Um, on my left hand, on the main thumb muscle, I have a scar. It's about... Uh, just over a centimetre long, and it's been there for over 30 years. Um, I was working for BP, British Petroleum, in one of their laboratories, uh, and my boss had asked me to do a particular setup, some experiment. And in preparation, I needed to push a glass tube through a rubber bung. Yeah, I know. You all know. You're all wise. You all knew beforehand. You know what's coming. Well, I didn't, uh, and uh, the glass tube snapped, and I rammed this piece of broken glass into my thumb, and it hurt. Um, but the thing that I've got, got more upset than the wound was, was several days later, uh, when the accident report was filled in, and my boss had to put a comment, he just wrote, he should have known better. <laughs> oh, thanks, mate. <laughs> the point was, I didn't know better, otherwise I wouldn't have done it. Who was responsible for making sure I knew what I was doing? I was a bit indignant at that. I sustained significant injury that I can still see the evidence of today because nobody warned me. So, I hope this little chat with each other has convinced us that most of the time, ignorance is not bliss. We're agreed? Ignorance is not bliss. And the person who warns you is your friend. <laughs> He's not the person trying to make you look small. He's your friend. Well done. I want to read to you what the Lord said to the prophet Ezekiel. This is in chapter 3 and from verse 16. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to a wicked person, you will surely die, and you do not warn them or speak out to dissuade them from the evil ways in order to save their life, that wicked person will die for their sin, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person and they do not turn from their wickedness or their evil ways, they will die for their sin, but you will have saved yourself. Again, when a righteous person turns from their righteousness and does evil, I'll put a stumbling block before them, they will die. Since you did not warn them, they will die for their sin. The righteous things that person did will not be remembered, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the righteous person not to sin, and they do not sin, they will surely live because they took warning. 
and you will have saved yourself. Well, that was a, a pretty heavy responsibility that the Lord laid at Ezekiel's feet, don't you think? Well, it had me sort of taking a step back. Part of his prophetic responsibility was to sound warning in the nation about wickedness and evil ways. Uh, and uh, he himself faced uh, accountability in the event of him failing to do that. In Jesus' earthly ministry, uh, it was full of warnings. It was, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, etc., etc. Um, John the Baptist, before Jesus, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Their, their ministry involved warning people of the consequences of their sins. I want to suggest to you that the church today, corporately, has this solemn responsibility to speak prophetically to our nation, as Ezekiel did to his, to warn it against evil and to point it towards Jesus. Jesus warned first century Israel, are we not his body? Has he changed? I don't think so. Jesus prayed on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They were ignorant as they crucified him. Their ignorance was a mitigation. But they still needed forgiveness. So ignorance can make it easier for someone to forgive you, but it doesn't change the fact that there's a sin needing forgiveness there. And perhaps my boss would quote this principle to me, my BP boss. People are responsible for what they may be reasonably expected to know. That's sort of like ignorance of the law is no excuse. If you may be reasonably expected to know it, or not to do something or to do something, you are responsible. You can't hide in ignorance. If we fail to speak, to warn, we may well find ourselves having to explain our silence to God at a later date. Uh, and, and I, for one, don't want to have that conversation with him. Uh, and I sincerely believe that you don't either. We need to be living righteous lives in a wicked world as a testimony that things don't have to be the way the world operates. If we ourselves have fallen into unrighteousness, then to open our voices would make us hypocrites. And no one listens to a hypocrite. This is easy with two hands. Hang on. Righteousness, it's not just about you and God. It's not just about pleasing God. It's not just about your fellowship with God, although that's very important. It's also about being an effective voice in the world. It's about being the salt and light that we're called to be. Righteousness, practical living righteousness, is about having the moral authority to speak into situations. It's an authority you throw away if you engage in unrighteous behavior. <clears throat> Consider, the adulterer may think that he's putting his marriage at risk. He may not care that much about that. 
But does he also realize that he stands to lose the respect of his children, mess up their relationship with authority generally, potentially their whole life long? Does he realize that because his children love him, they will try and minimize in their sight his sin, and once they've minimized it, they then open themselves up to following down exactly the same road. And so his sins are repeated into the next generation. You remember David's adultery with Bathsheba, leading to the murder of Uriah, leading to the rape of Tamar, the murder of Ammon, the rebellion of Absalom, the multiple marriages of Solomon, the division of the kingdom, etc., etc. The, the ripples and ramifications of that sin went through generation after generation, extending to the nation as a whole. He faced consequences in this world and judgment in the next. That adulterer needs to hear our warning. And actually, David left his in the scriptures for us. Consider the liar. He may think that unless he lies, he won't get what he wants. I can remember someone saying to me, I had to lie or they wouldn't have given it to me. Ouch. But does he realize that once he's been found out, and he will be found out, you cannot keep an important lie, you can't keep an important secret, it always comes out, if it's important. The Holy Spirit is incredibly active in the world, ensuring that important secrets don't stay secret. Once it comes out, once it's realized that a person has lied, everything they have ever said then becomes suspect. I don't go looking for lies in things people say to me. I guess I'm slightly on the gullible side. Uh, and, and you could probably get away with a whole load of little lies and I wouldn't really notice. But it's in the nature of lying that you get emboldened as you do it. Uh, and they get bigger and bigger. And eventually you're going to tell me such a whopper that even stupid me realizes that I'm being led down the garden path. <laughs> and when I realize that, I am then going to remember everything you have ever said, and I'm going to go looking for where lies may have occurred in the past. Everything the liar has ever said becomes unreliable once they're discovered. The trust is destroyed, all his relationships are compromised, And that's ongoing into the future. Not only is everything he has said suspect, everything he will say is now suspect as well. Serious stuff. Furthermore, this is an insight provided by George Bernard Shaw, a quote from him. The liar's punishment is not in the least that he is not believed, but rather that he can believe no one else. Who we are, we project onto other people. If we are a liar, we project that onto other people and we don't believe what they say to us. Ouch. The liar's 
curse is to live in a world in which he trusts no one because he himself is untrustworthy. So for the liar, there are severe consequences in this world and judgment in the next. The liar needs to hear our warning. By preserving a righteous walk and preserving our authority, our moral authority to speak into situations, we potentially become their friend. The person who warns you and so protects you from personal injury and other such disasters, they are your friend. You might not enjoy what they have to say, but if their heart is right, they've done you a favor. This moral authority means that our witness to Christ will be listened to. And that's a witness that the world desperately needs to hear from us and see in us. They need to see in us and hear from us the gospel. After all, it's the only hope the world has. Peter, in the fourth chapter of his first epistle, referring to the world, says... They're surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living. And they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. When the people of this world do things when they don't know any better, whose responsibility is it to tell them if it's not yours and mine? Whose responsibility is it to show them if it's not yours and mine? We need to be an irritation to them, a nagging puzzle, a constant surprise. They should be looking at us and scratching their heads, not quite able to make out who these people are and how they and why they operate the way they do. In the midst of the turmoil and the struggles of life that are common to everyone, where does their peace come from? How is it that having been floored by some disaster, they get up again and again and again. Why is it after being betrayed by this person or that person, they refuse to get bitter? How is it that after this atrocity or that atrocity, they are still able to forgive? Why are these people so generous with their time, with their money, with their resources generally. Why do these people, why do they listen? These are the sorts of questions that our lives need to be provoking in a wicked world. Our lives need to be different so that they are forced to the question, why? And maybe they'll start to suspect that it has something to do with their religion. Well, that's close. But we'll get them closer as we start to answer their questions. Because the answer to all those questions is caught up in the name of Jesus. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. 
To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.